I think Jackie began this morning saying, God is here. I think God is here. Amen. God has been here through the baptisms and through the worship and through our greeting each other with a sign of peace. And now let's experience God's presence through the reading of the scripture, which is found in Romans. As the Apostle Paul writes, Romans in chapter 8, I'll be reading verses 14 through 19. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Won't you join me in a word of prayer? Eternal God, on this day, on this Pentecost day, how we want your spirit to blow through us, around us, to anoint us with ears that can hear and hearts that can be enlarged and minds that can be stretched. And we want you to equip our feet to follow your path. And I ask, oh God, as we listen for a word from you, that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a really little girl, my sister and I shared everything, probably too many things, but we shared everything. Same clothes. Eight, only 21 months apart, same outfit, same bed, same bedroom, uh, bath time. And bath time was a thing you didn't mind sharing. Dad was the bather because mommy was working a second shift and he was tall and strong of hand. And bath time meant a big party. Rubber duckies, pink towels, and a big giant splash at the end to get you squeaky clean. And then a rough toweling because there was no way that there could be any moisture getting back in that bed with you. But I believe that my, my dad's early bath time somehow prepared me for this, this thing I can never do without crying. The splash of water that says there's a parent that loves you, a parent that cares for you, a parent that will come get you when you're cold and make you warm and keep you safe. Mom wasn't the bath mom, but she was the prayer mom. Every night, every night, mommy and you on your knees. Lord, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That was a scary prayer upon retrospect. <laughs> Say what? What? We might die. But her soft lips kissing me goodnight, made it all better. I may have told you the story before, and if I have, forgive me, but that first communion where the bread is coming by me, and it's I'm not sure exactly what it means, but mom leans over and whispers in my ear, when you eat that bread, it means God loves you. And you eat the bread, and it is the sweetest bread. It is the most delicious bread. It's sticky to your mouth, roof bread, but it is so good. And it means God loves you. And then the little cups come by, and they're grape juice cups. And Mommy says, when you take that cup, it means God will never leave you. God loves you. God will never leave you. God is a parent who will splash you clean and keep you safe. That's the first God I met when I was looking for someone to love. 
Millions of stars placed in the sky by one God. Million of men lift up their eyes to one God. Did y'all sing that song growing up? God loved me, and God loved everyone else. And I was pretty sure that all around the globe, young people were learning the same thing. God loves me, and God loves everyone else. What happened? What in the heck happened? High school and youth group, we were still clear that God was on everybody's side. But right around college, right around Campus Crusade for Christ and that throne and the cross on the throne, and some of y'all were there. <laughs> Let the me decrease so the God can increase. Right in there, right around there, with gospel songs like, There is no way unto the Father but through Christ, his only Son. Good lyrics, not, but good music. Only Jesus alone, only Jesus alone, only Jesus alone, only Jesus, him alone. Sung with the passion of an 18-year-old and a good bass drop in, in the background. No questioning the theology, only Jesus alone. Suddenly, my God that loved everybody and everybody was on everybody's team had like a little hole only through which a few of us could go. And our goal was to get through the hole, to be good enough, strong enough, nice enough, kind enough to get through the hole. And if you had the opportunity, you'd get some unsaved child, we didn't know any Muslims and Jews then, but some unsaved Christian, and get him in a corner and read him the prayer and get him to convert. Somebody say amen. It was confusing to me. What happened to my little girl God? What happened to the one who put the stars in the sky and all the children called God by one name, Abba, Father, Papa. When I went to seminary, I had to take a class on evangelism, and by then my God was growing up once again. And by growing up, I mean growing back to the first one. I took that evangelism class under protest. What? I'm supposed to, what? Go to China and teach the Chinese people to believe in Jesus? They seem to be doing just fine. Go to Africa and teach the Muslims to believe in Jesus. And by the way, take on all our Western values too. I had an intuition that there was something wrong. I, I just, it didn't seem right. It didn't seem, it seemed like God was bigger than that. Like if there was a God, and I really believed there was a God, I couldn't figure out why God would only want the Jehovah's Witnesses and therefore 144,000. I couldn't figure out why God would only want the Christians and only certain kinds of Christians, meaning Western Roman ones, not Orthodox Eastern ones, and certainly not Catholic ones. Pfft, they were passe. I, as was the Pope. I'll, I'll, I'll come back. I, I couldn't imagine... Why, why in the name of God there were crusades? And I couldn't imagine why in the name of God there were wars and scourges and torture to make sure that people thought about God the right way. Has that ever given you a headache? Certainly there are texts in the Christian scriptures that if we look for them and we read them a certain way, they might make us think God only belongs to us. But there are texts in the Bible that make it clear that that's not true. I preached a couple, one a couple of weeks ago from Revelation about all of the voices praising God in one voice. And today on this Pentecost, one of our lectionary passages, one of our chosen passages, has nothing at all to do with that lovely text in Acts, which I like, by the way. I like that text in Acts, where the disciples are all together, and they're preaching a sermon, and they're talking in Aramaic. But by some miracle, 
the Holy Spirit zaps in their mouths and everybody can hear the good deeds of God's power in their own language. Medes, Parthenians, people from Mesopotamia, all of them hear the Aramaic translated for them. Sadly, the church has focused too much on the red fire and, you know, whatever that means. But the miracle of translation, I like that. I like one, one, one word, and it's translated in many voices. But today's text, I picked today's text because Paul isn't talking about that. Paul who never met Jesus. Paul who had a conversion late to the table. Paul who got knocked off his horse and blinded by the light had this insight. That the Holy Spirit brought with her a gift. And the gift was being led not unlike Israel was led by the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud through the wilderness to the promised land. Paul's insight is that the Spirit of God leads us to be able to join Jesus in praying this prayer. Abba. Daddy. Papi. Baba. In other words, the Spirit of God leads us to a new identity. We are God's children now. Not enemies, not at enmity, not at war with God, not outside of God's grace, not away from God, not broken, not sinful, but God's children now. And so the Spirit of God leads us to be able to just cry out, Abba, I've been in Jerusalem. One time I was in Jerusalem standing in a McDonald's because you must go to a McDonald's when you're in Jerusalem. <laughs> you have to go to the, the McDonald's everywhere you are because it's just too obscene that there's a McDonald's, right? You just have to walk in there and be like, oh, so they have French, they have like French, you know, Big Macs and stuff. It's really freaky. But I was in the McDonald's in Jerusalem about 12 years ago and to hear the little kids saying, Abba, 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 can I have a Big Mac? The intimacy of the baby saying Abba puts this prayer in context. It's an intimate relationship. It's not about transcendence and far awayness, and it's not about things we can't attain. It's about family. It's about family. Paul's insight is that the Holy Spirit comes not to, not to become a litmus test for holiness, not to, not to, you know, help us speak in tongues so nobody knows what the heck we're talking about. Oh, and then somebody has to translate it. But if you can do that, then you're really holier than everybody else. Not to give us an increase of gifts to make us stand out and be puffed up. But in fact, to humble us and to, and to horizontally connect. Is this horizontal? Yeah, to horizontally connect us to each other and to our God who is love. The Holy Spirit, Paul's insight is that by connecting us to one another, we let go of judgments and focus on justice. We let go of fear and embrace faith. We let go of hostility and spend more time risking hope. We let go of hatred, and we receive the healing that is right here before us. You've had these moments. You've had these moments where it all goes away, haven't you? You've had these moments where it doesn't matter what color somebody is. It doesn't matter what, who, who they love and how they love them. It doesn't matter if they're Christian or Jewish or Buddhist. or You don't care. Maybe you had it during Sandy. Not you, Sandy, but the storm. Maybe you had it during 9-11. Maybe you have it on the subway where it just, it's just a bunch of hot bodies and you're like, it doesn't really matter. I've had these moments, incredible moments this last year, last year in Jerusalem where I met Neil the Bedouin. Neil the Bedouin who was trying to sell me jewelry. 
But before that, he took me up on top of the old city and showed me the city from a scape I've never imagined before. And you see the tops of the mosques and the tops of the synagogues and the tops of the churches and all of these symbols just sticking up in this place that everybody calls holy. And Neil, the Bedouin, whose ancestors would have been like Abraham, took me and John into his shop, still trying to sell jewelry, but gave us a cold drink of water and took out this two-stringed instrument and began to strum it and sang us three songs. One was the happy song, and it was something like, kind of atonal. Then he sang us the sad song, and it was something like, in other words, it was kind of the same. And, um, <laughs> but the third song was a little different, and he called it the healing song. And he said, if everyone who says they loved God would love God just 1%, just 1%. He didn't say 1% more. He just said just one. If everybody who lo- says they love God loved God 1%, there'd be no war. There'd be no killing. There'd be no occupations. There'd be no settlements. There'd be no planes knocking down towers. Heck, maybe there'd be no towers. I had one moment like that with Neil the Bedouin. You've had those moments, right? I had a moment like that a couple of weeks ago in Pakistan with Eduardo and Bob and Hussein and some others. We met a woman whose only job is to try to bring back young men who have been radicalized to be terrorists. And what does she do? She just goes and sits in the living rooms or the kitchens of their mothers, and she pulls out the Quran, and she just reads it to them and says, this is what it really says. This is what it really says. And she uses her body and her passion and her compassion and her patience to just sit with those mothers until those mothers are radicalized for peace. And she's turned 100 boys back from the edge to the true Islam. Muslims believe we're all Muslim because we're all called to be obedient to God. So they were reverted, if you will, back to Islam. You've had those moments, don't you? I had another moment in Pakistan with these girls from the Critical Thinking Institute, a bunch of young college women in various levels of dress, some full hajib, some kind of funky fresh and uh, not so covered, but all of them to a person, the hope of the Muslim world, smart, talented, gifted, outspoken, critical of U.S. foreign policy and critical of the complicence in Pakistani policy, all hoping for peace. I had a moment like that in a mosque two years ago in Oman, in a mosque this year in Islamabad, where the men who show me the mosque are so proud of the mosques that they're showing, they just are like, if Moses was, had Shekinah glory on his face, so also these guys. Look at the chandelier. Look at the light. Look at the light. Look at the... Can you believe this thing stands up all by itself? Just like a Bedouin tent, it won't fall down. Look at the inscription. Look at the, look at the letters. Look at the awe of their faces that they have for their God. And I'm back to the God of the little girl, Jackie. Millions of stars placed in the sky by one God. Millions of men and women lift up their eyes to one God. On this Pentecost, I'm not thinking so much about the church's birthday. I'm thinking about the birth of a human family who can believe once and for all that we just don't know enough about God to box God in a box. What happened? Maybe it was natural. Maybe, maybe it was unavoidable even. 
that we were in some cave and somebody else was in another cave and their fire was bigger than our fire and their goat was bigger than our goat and we thought our God was blessing us more because the goat was bigger than the little goat and they had 18 babies and we only had three so we thought their God was stronger and then we made our gods fight on the global God fighting scale. Come on. We've outgrown that. We, each of us, come to know God on our mama's knees, or on our grandma's feet, or in the backyard talking about religion. And some of us get to study it for a living, and some of us get really screwed up for doing that. Oops, messed up. But Paul's insight is this. The Spirit of God comes to lead us through the wilderness of divisiveness, through the desert of division, through the wild places where we just can't stand each other, to the place where we recognize that we are family, period, period, period. And that God loves me just as much as God loves you. And it is our child of Godness that ought to make us ethical people. It's our child of godness that ought to make us loving people, compassionate people, gentle people, generous people. But there's nothing about child of godness that ought to make us enemies of one another. God is big enough, vast enough, mysterious enough, kind enough, loving enough to love the atheist as much as God loves Mother Teresa. To love the Muslim as much as God loves the Jew and the Christian, as much as God loves the Buddhist. And all of these religions and symbols are just languages of God just trying to get through, just trying to get through. I'm trying to get through to you, so I'll say it the way you need to hear it. But I want to know you, and I want you to be known by me, and I want you to love me back. And I'm sorry the hatred thing is blocking our flow. So, happy birthday to the human beings who are loved by their God. Happy birthday to the revelations that happened in the Torah and happened in the spirit. Torah, Torah, you say? No. Happy birthday to the revelation by the prophet Muhammad. May he be blessed. Happy birthday to all of the ones who are still trying to tell us what God is like and all of us who want to hear. Happy birthday to that spirit at work right now, right now, to change our minds and open our hearts. We cannot be exclusive because we just don't know enough. Let's love each other instead. I love you. I, I just need your help with, with the benediction. You have to sit down. Thank you so much. People are like, is she telling us to sit down? Are you a child of God? Yes. Are you a child of God? Yes. Stand up if you're a child of God. Are you a child of God? Yes. Is she a child of God? Yes. How about her? Yes. How about those boys that bombed Boston? Yes. How about those people in India who have no idea who, we, who Jesus is? Yes. How about those crazy people on the street? Yes. The Spirit of God has enabled us to all call God Father. It's the great equalizer. We are God's family now. Go in the world, be salt and light, and love. Amen.